So I visualize information and ideas and conversation. So as a live illustrator, a graphic facilitator, a professional doodler, when I'm at conferences and in these meetings, as I'm hearing the information or hearing the voices, I'm live drawing and writing out what I'm hearing in real time, creating a cohesive visual of what was just said or discussed. So hopefully by the time that presentation, whether it's a half an hour or a day long meeting is over, I'm also done. Welcome to the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany Business Consulting and your host for today. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell so that you can get updated every time we drop a new episode. Now, without further ado, let's get it started. Thanks for being here. All right, I guess we are live. Hey, folks, welcome to another episode of, let's see, what, what was our new, new show coming? So, so backstory, uh, the name of the show was originally Epiphany Off the Cuff. And we rolled with that for about two years and loved it and all this and all that. And then we went on a hiatus and decided, hey, you know what? We're going to just sit back and see what the, what, the, what the universe brings us. And so we came up with the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. And so believe it or not, I'm still trying to get it to roll off my tongue. This is naturally the other one. But you know what? Let's go with it. <laughs> so... Oh, that's funny. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I was like, when it said our pal, and then it said off the cuff, I was like, hmm, something I, maybe I'm in, I don't know. I was like, I'm just going to show up and see what happens. So that's, so I'm, yeah, that makes sense. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's, 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 it's been interesting. Cause it's like, you know, you always have that theory, like as an entrepreneur, sometimes you just have to like jump off the bridge and build a plane on the way down. This is, this is that. <laughs> This is quite literally that. I was on Sunday. I'm sitting here. It's just like, okay, let's let's get these automations in place, like, finally. And it's like, oh, man, going through them this morning. But uh, such is life. Such is life. Well, Ashton, thank you so much for joining. This is um, – it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and a pleasure. I um, Since our interview, since our first conversation, uh, I was really – I'm really excited. You know, the, what you're doing, the stuff that you're doing, I know our audience is really going to enjoy. And – um, I, I just think it's really cool. So anyway, That's folks. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks for having absolutely, me. Absolutely, absolutely. So folks, welcome to uh, the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany, and I'm going to be your host today. And today in the studio, we have Ashton. Ashton, welcome once again. Yeah, happy to be here, Rick. What a pleasure. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, folks, before we get started, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell so you get notifications every time we drop a new episode, and let's get to it. So, Ashton, what's the backstory? Tell us about yourself. <laughs> oh, where should I begin? Where should I begin? Yeah, so I was always a very creative child. Is that a bad thing? Is that like, dabbler, like writing on the wall, sort of creative child? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not writing on the wall, but like name a creative medium. And I've probably tried it once Good or twice. Uh, I met my husband in high school while I was knitting because wow. that's how cool I was back then. And I remember him being like 10 years old and cross stitching like a little old wow, lady. Okay. <laughs> so I've always been very creative, but I didn't really pursue art as a serious profession in any form. I definitely really was heavily influenced in a lot of negative stories around artists and you can't make money as an artist and starving, you know, the starving artist thing that is probably not new to anybody here listening. So I really wasn't really sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I started working with children, started learning about community development, facilitation, really fell in love with that world which then introduced me into the world of graphic facilitation, which I didn't even know what it was <laughs> when I heard about it, started diving into it, took a one day workshop and that was ex almost exactly 10 years ago wow, now wow. and kind of the rest was history. Yeah. Awesome. 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 And so um, tell, tell, tell the audience what you do. I don't, I don't know if you have anything you could show us, but tell, tell them what you do. Yeah, so, so I do the I same thing. I, 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 no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I visualize information and ideas and conversation. 
So as a live illustrator, a graphic facilitator, a professional doodler, when I'm at conferences and in these meetings, as I'm hearing the information or hearing the voices, I'm live drawing and writing out what I'm hearing in real time, creating a cohesive visual of what was just said or discussed. So hopefully by the time that presentation, whether it's a half an hour or a day long meeting is over, I'm also done and there's that representation. Um, so people are able to engage with it however they want to and see it unfold in front of their eyes at the same time. So if I'm in person, that's literally drawing on like pieces of like gigantic pieces of paper, like covering the walls, or that is uh, digitally. So instead of seeing me in a Zoom screen, you might see something very, just like a big white screen to yeah. start. And then it un the drawing unfolds within that screen. So people get to be along for that journey. Cool, cool, cool. I, I kind of got stuck a little bit when you said, I hear the voices and I start to draw. I'm just like, okay. Oh. <laughs> Let's not get stuck there yeah, though. Let's not get stuck there though. Okay. Less about my own voices and more about other people's, but yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And and so how does how do people benefit from that? I mean, what's what's the what's the draw there? All right, see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> pun intended. Pun intended. I love a good pun. So yeah, so when people see it unfold, a lot of people think in pictures, right? So it resonates. A lot of people, even though technically learning styles are debunked, but whatever, people still resonate with learning mm -hmm. styles and visual is one of them. And so there's this sort of, you know, brain science and how we think. And most of us are visual in our thinking, right? We would, we just don't like all of us are like, our majority of us are visual thinkers. We just don't know that we right. are. <laughs> so we think in pictures, like, you know, you've probably were at a restaurant one time and you asked for a pen from the waiter or waitress and you like drew something on a napkin, like that's visual thinking in process. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but we just kind of, we don't give those tools or those ideas and ways of working and thinking, we don't give it much thought. We just think, oh, it's just a thing that we do. But it actually is quite a powerful tool to help you engage with your own learning and try to break down complex yeah. ideas through images. So, you know, it's really hard to really break down complexity just in your head yeah. alone. Yeah. Right. Well, oftentimes we'll grab a pile of sticky notes and make a bunch of notes or or, uh, you know, if you've got a whiteboard in your office or in your boardroom, whatever, and you just like, you know, make some bad quote unquote drawings. But it doesn't really matter what it looks like. It's just the action of using drawing as a thinking tool. Right. So there's that sort of space when you're doing it and you're experiencing it. But then also when you're in a meeting it's a very, still very novel way to be able to interact with your own ideas and see how they connect with others. So when I'm working there as a professional and I'm hearing all these ideas, I'm like thinking about how do these ideas connect to one another and how can I represent that visually that's going to make sense for people. So, you know, when I'm in, in a room and I can do that for people, they can see a feel seen, they can feel heard, this was a good productive use of their time. <laughs> it creates that cohesiveness um, and it can create a bit of an accountability tool moving forward into, into the future, depending on what it is that conversation yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, wow, wow. Retention must be like off the charts with that. I mean, I, I know, like like you're saying, it's like, you know, I need, I have an idea or something like that. I've got to get it on my whiteboard. I've got to get it. You know, and it's a lot faster to kind of draw out, you know, a process or, you know, whatever it is than, you know, put it down on paper. And even if I put it down on paper, just like, it's easier. Let's just, let's just put it on. Let's just put it on a map. So I just imagine like with what you're doing, you know, for a larger group, you know, um, I guess you get retention. But I guess if you're in like a brainstorming type of session, you probably get more ideas. And as you said, like cohesion, is, is that about right or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. If you can see it in front of you, right, you can already see the connections. Whereas if you're just kind of talking without a visual yeah. cue, 
You know, you might not know the ideas that actually came to the top that everybody started jumping yeah. on. You might at the end of the meeting be like, well, right, there was that thing we were talking a lot about, but like, we don't know. Sometimes it's, you know, at its simplistic form, it can kind of see, you can very easily see which ideas kind of rose to the top as like the biggest conversation yeah. piece or what have you, so that you know what to do moving forward or creating that action item list. Like you see that cohesion um, or allowing people to, be able to contribute to a bigger conversation and see how does your voice fit in with the collective whole. And if a lot of people are saying the same thing here, but then a lot of people are saying something different, how can we bring those things together to make sure that everybody feels like they're a part of the strategy or the vision moving forward in the business or organization or something like that, yeah. right? Um, and not and by having something visual that's going to re, you know resonate with the majority of the people in a room, right, to be able to help keep that conversation going is, I think, pretty important. Cool, cool, cool. What, what, what was a, what's a, what's a great story, I guess, that, that comes to mind where, you know, people just add, like, aha moments uh, all over the place? Oh, my gosh. I think the ones that stand up for, stand out for me the most, to be honest with you, are those moments where I realized such an honor it is to be holding that pen for people, especially for people who haven't had a voice before. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I find myself in situations where I'm like the only white person in the room drawing out conversations and that's like kind of awkward. Um, but I'm there trying to elevate and have this conversation and trying to help them move forward with something, no matter, you know, how I feel about something like it is really difficult to put your own bias aside. You just have to recognize that everyone yeah. does. And I try not to let that creep into what it is that I'm doing to really honor the space and the people in it. And, you know, some of the ones that are most memorable are when people have come up to me and they've said things to me like, you know, one guy, we were doing like an employee engagement thing and we had to go in multiple times over the course of two days, like even at like midnight <laughs> to get feedback from people that worked in those shifts. And you know, I had this guy come up to me and he said, I've worked here for 40 years and no one has ever asked me how I felt before. Right. So, you know, it's in those moments that you're not just creating a, a helping them have a voice, you're helping them feel seen. Yeah. And it is like quite an honor to, to be there. And, and I think it, once I started having more and more of those ex experiences, it really did allow me to feel like the value of what it is that I'm doing is not just there to like draw a pretty picture. Yeah. <laughs> it really has so many intricate layers underneath of it. Um, and, and when you can get rooted in your own value that you're providing for somebody, it's a lot easier from like a business perspective too, because you get the confidence that if someone says no to your service, it's like, that's too bad because I know the people in the room from my experience for 10 years would benefit yeah. from it, right? If you're choosing not to invest in it, like that's an unfortunate circumstance yeah. that you're doing that yeah. um, because I know that people would, um, which is, you know, it's a funny thing when you're running a business and you're like selling your services and, you know, it, it is going to provide a lot of value for people there, but you know, you're also selling a service, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you could say everything all day long, how it's going to help people. Um, but people have to truly believe that that's yeah. true or they're not going to want to hire you. Right. So it's, it is quite like, honestly, the majority of my, my work is from other people experiencing it, right. They were in the room that I was in, that I was doing, and I was drawing their voice. And then they come up to me and say, oh, my gosh, we have a meeting coming up in two months. Would you come? Right. So it's a it's an experience that people have. Whereas if someone just went to my website, it doesn't really convert people because they didn't have a connection to that information. I can I can talk about the value all day long, but unless someone experienced it and felt seen and felt heard, like those are such intangibles like, how do you sell that? How do you talk? How do you like sell transformation? It's very difficult unless someone has had that experience. And that's what sort of worked for me. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> and I'm busy enough. Like right. I, I have lots to do, which is great. Um, 
you know, but it's, I just wish more and more people had the opportunity to experience yeah, it. Sure. So, um, I, I had a couple of questions. I, I, I think one, one thing that popped out to me is I got the impression that you're not always interviewing. It, it's not everybody is speaking at the same time or cause you mentioned that with the one person that was coming in, like on a, uh, like on a midnight shift or shift or something like that, and you wanted to get, um, their story. So is, is that typical or atypical? Um, every engagement is different. Like there's like my conference world conference is pretty straightforward. Yeah. You have a big conference, you got 20 speakers or you got five speakers. I create a visual for each presentation. I'm not like really involved in the process. I'm there like listening with everybody yeah. else and you've got your visual deliverables and people post them on Twitter and they get all shared out and it's a great time, right? Instead of just like posting a picture of someone on a yeah. stage, which is like so boring or like a slides, like, Ooh, nice. uh -huh. <laughs> so they're nice. You know, there's, there's that sort of nice thing about conferences and I love doing conferences. You can kind of go in and go out and, and it's done and you can move on. Um, and I get to learn a lot about a lot of different things uh -huh. when I'm in those situations. Um, but in facilitation type settings, like everyone is so unique and different. Like they're all different depending on who's going to be in the room, what needs to be discussed, right? Like that one with the employee, we've, I've done a few of those kinds of things where, you know, not everybody could be in the room at the same time. And maybe that's not the right place. Even if they could be in the room at the same time, maybe it's not the right place yeah. for that. Right. So that's where I'm able to kind of lean in on some of my facilitation experience and then also partner with other facilitators in those types of mm -hmm. settings to make sure that it's set up in a way that's going to resonate most with the group. And a lot of times I just like I actually really love not being involved in like the bureaucracy of that organization, <laughs> because like you as the outside perspective, uh -huh. like sometimes you have to do things that people aren't going to like, like I have to talk to the client and say, if someone says something, I'm going to draw it. I'm not, I can't filter it. I'm not going to change their words. And if you're trying to get feedback from people, you have to know that people might say things that you might not like, and you have to be okay with that. And if you're just looking to check a box, then we're probably not going to be the right fit because I can't like, what am I going to do? Like, I really need to honor the people and I'm not going to sugarcoat something to like stroke your ego and make you feel better. <laughs> so like I have to have, it's interesting because I really have to try to build trust with clients like as quickly as like even before they even decide to hire me because, you know, I might be in a situation where we have to like call out the elephant in the room, be like, what are we actually talking about here, people? Mm -hmm. We know there's a bigger issue. We're talking about this, but we know there's a bigger issue when we need to discuss it. And the great thing about being in that situation is, um, you know, ideally they hired you again, that would be a good time. But if you need to do something that's going to be in service to the people in the room, you have to do that, whether or not you make someone upset or not. Ideally, you can give your client a heads up of what's coming. And sometimes they actually love it because they're not the one calling out the elephant in the room. They make you yeah. do it. <laughs> right? It's actually kind of like they kind of use you as a scapegoat. And that's actually, it's not a bad thing, right? Um, from an outside pr perspective. And if they didn't like the meeting, they can blame the outside perspective right. or the outsider <laughs> rather than blame Judy from HR or something, right? right? Um, so it's uh, in those Every situation is so unique and different and you have to, um, yeah, just sort of go in and knowing like, why are we here? Like, what does success look like? Like at the end of the day, you know, if you just wanted to do this because you're supposed to do this meeting once a year, like I'm probably not interested. Like I love having the opportunity of like, you know, that this meeting was well worth the time to be here to gather everybody like it's an investment to gather people across a company or organization especially if they're like across the country or the world like the, like these companies like they're spending a decent amount of money just to bring people yeah. in right even if virtually that's like a lot of like of their time to be there for an hour or a day or more right it has to be worth the investment and if we're just going to like do niceties for the whole two days like that's not something that i'm interested in doing i like 
getting in there and doing the hard like that's what's like fun for me it's like ooh, how much conflict is there that's a oh, good Lord. time <laughs> <laughs> just stir the pot up for him right <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that there's a goal on the other end is like we might have to deal with some conflict to get to the place where you right. want to go. And if this, if you want to, if you're going to be investing in hiring me or the people I work with or what have you, it's like you want this to be good use of your time, right? And your investment yeah. to be able to do. It. And like, there's just so much around company culture now, which I'm very excited yeah. about. Um, yeah. I, you know, and I think companies are realizing some of these pieces need areas of investment to retain your workforce and and all of that, right? And and trying to allow people to have a voice. You know, sometimes they're not comfortable going to Judy from HR, but they'll talk to the outsider who then can go and say, "These are things that are happening," and they're not saying, "Oh well," you know. Job. Mark from accounting isn't happy or whatever. Right, 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 right. right. So, at at what point did you did you realize that this was a business? Yeah. So I started doing a little bit of this on the side, charging very little. I had some facilitator friends who would bring me in on some projects. Mm -hmm. Um, because I decided I really wanted to learn how to do the visual aspect really well that I decided I would partner with other facilitators when they were like larger yeah. projects. Um, and I just started diving into like the worldwide community that exists around visual communication, visual thinking, graphic facilitation, all the words. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't, so I was playing around for a little bit and about two years or so, trying to figure out like, is this just like something fun for me to do when I get asked? Or do I want to take this more seriously and try to build a business? But living in rural Canada in the middle of literally nowhere, <laughs> I was like, I'm, is it even possible for me to create a business around this? Like I, have, like, I don't know anybody who's really doing yeah. this. And there's very few, like there's just very, very few people around. And so I went to a conference in Austin, Texas in 2015 with the International Forum for Visual Practitioners. And that's the worldwide kind of association for people who do this type of work. And I went there with a very, I'm very goal-minded, right? So I went there with a very specific goal in mind. And I was like, I'm going to go to this conference and I'm going to look and seek out all the business stuff. I want to see if I think this is possible for me to start a business by the end of this conference, I will have made a decision. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to decide. I, I'm going to decide if this is going to be a fun side thing or I'm going to go all in and actually make a business out of this. And so obviously, you know the answer to that question. But I sought out the opportunities. They had some workshops on around business building. And I got to like listen to people saying like, oh, yeah, I worked for myself for 20 years doing this and I make all this money and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, because I'm like very grateful for those people and their transparency at that event, because it allowed for me to see, hey, like, you know, they're smart. I'm pretty smart. I'm sure I could figure this out, too. And uh, yeah, so I was seven months pregnant with my second child at the time. So after he was born about a year or so later, um, I still played around and did projects. I remember him like laying on the floor mm -hmm. and me working on stuff. But it was about a year after that that I was like, OK, I'm going to like take building a business seriously and not just kind of be staying up and after the kids go to bed and working right. on it for an hour or two in the evening. I'm going to take this and really see if I can figure out how to do this. And um, that was like, yeah, late 2016. Wow. Wow. Good for you. As, as a creative, um, I mean, did you, what, what, how did you leverage that in terms of building your business? How did you, how did you le leverage your creativity? Yeah, it's being a creative entrepreneur is it's such a funny thing because us creatives, or I guess maybe I'll just speak for myself, as a creative, it's very hard to separate the creation, the creative work from business. So I have some friends and they call it my hipster scale. I'm just always sliding. I'm like, oh, I'm very like, okay, I'm I'm creating. Oh, now I'm sliding to the business. And I think 
you know, you can't live in just one area all of the time. You can't just be the creative because then you're not making any money and you can't focus on just the business because then you're not doing the creative work that requires they is required to make the money. So I think you need to like, if it's a, a, a minute by minute or a day by day, you know, some days I'm in a lot of meetings. Like today I have talking to you. I have a meeting after this. Like it's a lot of like, you know, kind of background stuff, mm -hmm. but then tomorrow I'm going to be finishing up some creative projects. Right. And that's just the nature of how my week is going. But some weeks it's very business heavy and some weeks it's very creative heavy. And I think it's this just interesting balance and allowing yourself to also not get sucked into when you get rejection, that they're not saying no to you as a creative person, which is very easy to slide into. And I definitely did those first few years because I, I was learning about business. I was learning about how to ex describe the value, how to follow up with people, how to communicate, how to put contracts mm -hmm. together, like making it all up as I went along. And made lots of mistakes and learned a lot about the process. But in those early days, there was just so much rejection. And it's like, it was very difficult to separate. They're not saying no to the creative work. They're just saying no to the business side of it. And I try to use those opportunities when I would get rejected of like, what could I have done? Could I have done something? Like, could I have explained this differently? Could I have showed this opportunity? Like, you know, and I think it's like an energetic thing in the beginning too, because you're, you do have a lot of scarcity and you say yes to everything when you probably shouldn't, because it's not the right fit, you know it deep down, right? So, you know, luckily I kind of, those first, first few years were definitely challenging to work through some of those things, but I'm really glad that I pr pushed through to kind of get, I feel like I'm on this other side now where you know, I call it like confidence in action, where you just feel so grounded in the value of what you do. Like I said earlier, if they choose not to work with you, that's just too bad. Because um, I know that like I have a different presence when I'm chatting with people about it today than I did a few years ago, where you'd be like, please hire me, please, please hire me. Or now I'm just like, hire me or don't, like whatever, <laughs> you know? And you'd think that would put people off, but like, I just literally straight up tell people, like, if you're not fun, I don't want to work with you. Like, I, life is too short to work with people who are just going to like, you know, nitpick everything to death and not give up creative control. I'm like, if you're hiring me as the creative to help you with this, you know? I need to have a certain amount, like you have to trust me and I have to have some control over this project, right? Um, and I, if I don't think it's going to be there, then I just say no to the project, mm -hmm. right? Because I know I can deliver results for people. And, you know, I've only have, honestly, I've ever had like a handful of people that have been like mean or grumpy about something that I did. And usually it was just unrealistic expectations, right? So, um you know, it does, it does, like, I find for me anyways, it did take some time to kind of get on the other side of that and just, like, come out being, like, confident right. and being, like, hire me or don't hire me. That's fine. But it was, like, early years of me just being, like, please hire me. Please, please hire yep, me. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> absolutely. 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 Has, um, have you ever found, like, uh, and, I, and I guess you kind of alluded to it, but have you ever found your creative side to be, uh, like, a disadvantage on the business side of things? Um, I think like, I, I see it as a disadvantage for people who just don't know. Right. So, and, and usually those people aren't my clients anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But so like the example, um, we had our uncle over for dinner a few weeks ago and my dad said, can you please explain to your uncle what you do for work? Cause every time I try to explain it to somebody, they just say, and she makes money doing that? <laughs> like, they just don't know. And I think it goes back to the that experience. But if those people were in that room and they were feeling heard and seen and valued in a conversation, they'd be like, of course she makes money doing this. Like, this is so valuable. Like, even I wouldn't have to describe it to them, right? So I think it's like, it's more so from that perspective of the like, the wider people who are like, 
I, I'm very curious what people in my own very small community think about me. Like, I'm like, what do they think I do all day? <laughs> you know, I honestly don't know. They're like, oh, Ashton, doing her cute little art thing. Look at her, right? And it's fine. They can think I'm doing my cute little art thing, but I also know I'm running a serious business here and I'm making money doing it. And, you know, that's fine by me. I don't need to gain anyone's approval or try to convince anybody of the value of it, especially if they're not my ideal client. Like, yeah, like I, I've had certainly like over the years had people have some pretty like ignorant remarks to what it is that I do. Like saw so a guy at an airport a couple years ago and he was just like shocked that someone would ever consider flying me. And at that time I was flying like four times a month to places all over the place before COVID. Oh. And he was just like shocked that somebody would hire me to fly to go and do this work, right? Um, you know, and you just like, you just have to choose not to get bent out of shape about that kind of stuff. People just don't have the knowledge mm -hmm. about it is what you do or they haven't experienced it. And, you know, so I don't know if that's like a disadvantage, but it's certainly kind of a funny thing. It's a funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion, my opinion, my opinion, my opinion. My opinion. So here's a question for you. So um, how would you describe one, one of the conversations I've been having with folks uh, has been around like their superpower? You know, what is it that they, you know, what it, was it, what is it that they do better than anybody else um, in order to, you know, provide value, give back to the world, so to speak? Where, where does that sit for you? I would say, I would say break down complexity. That that's my sim simplifying. That's my superpower. I love it. Like if something isn't, um, you know, if it's not in a like grade three or four reading level, like I'm not interested. It's not a good time. So that's sort of where I, that's sort of my, my jam. We're talking about, um, you know, creatives and, and, you know, getting a business and some of the, um, some of the, uh, or, or your experience, I should I should say, as a, as a as a business owner, and I was curious. I, I guess um, I was I was I, I guess I was thinking I was thinking a few different things. You know, as as an entrepreneur, you know, you have I guess sort of archetypes that maybe you look up to. Who, who's someone that you you think about and say, hey, you know what that that person's done it, and I kind of I kind of want to do that. What that person has done. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Um, well, I don't know if I can give any specific examples in this exact moment, but I will say like I am move I am doing some transitions in my business right now instead of like I still want to be doing some graphic recording, like the live yeah. work, but I'm transitioning more into education. So teaching others how to do this for themselves. Oh, wow students, people and businesses who attend a lot of meetings and they can take their own notes in a visual yeah. way. So I'm sort of transitioning. So right now I'm just kind of like researching and like looking up to people more in that space when it comes to education and building communities yeah. and things like that. And it's definitely very interesting because I never really considered myself like a digital business, even though I still do, or I do a lot now digitally since COVID when I moved a lot of it online, yeah. I never still really considered myself a digital business, even though everything at that point was online. But now I'm kind of transitioning into like more digital business world, which is like a whole other thing for me. So there's certain things that I've been doing all along, like building my newsletter and, and, and having some, you know, digital processes online, but the sort of like, you know, marketing from a digital perspective is all kind of new to me. So just sort of moving into that phase of, of my work. And what does that look like from how I want to show up online and how do I want to communicate with people? Try not to get like sucked into um, people who have it like a very specific way, but I really want to like, I like I use my intuition a lot when I'm working and I really want to like show up and be myself. Yeah. And what is that? How does that translate? Um, because my, my work up until this point has been very like 
personal when I'm meeting someone um, and getting to know them online or in person, but it's a kind of a different world. So I'm just sort of in that space right now. So I don't know if I have anyone specifically that I'm like looking up to. I'm just kind of like taking it all yeah. in and looking for people that fe- seem really authentic in their approach. Um, that's sort of where I'm kind of like scoping things out right now and kind of treading water a little bit when it comes to that kind of stuff. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Do you, do you see yourself as like a, like broadening your business or is this a different, like a, a complete evolution? Oh, it's a compute, complete evolution, but like the live work is still exciting to yeah. me, but part of me, like I've always like known that this is such a powerful school that doesn't have, always have to be in the hands of a professional, right? That people can experience the benefit for themselves by learning how to do it. And it doesn't have to be scary. Yeah. Like I can teach you how to draw in like 15 minutes. Like it doesn't have to be scary. Yeah. Right. So, um, So I always really knew when I first started that I'd love to get into this eventually. And for some reason, now that I'm like, oh, I can say I'm 10 years in, it's like, I felt like I have like this badge of approval, which is, is not ridiculous. (laughs) It's ridiculous. But but still I was like, oh, I've been doing this for 10 years. So I must know what I'm talking about. Um, So it's not like a whole complete evolution because I still want to do some of the live work. I could just see myself burning out in a couple of years from doing it. And I'm always looking for a different challenge. And I feel like I haven't challenged myself in quite a while because with, I was, I had some big plans for 2020 (laughs) and those got squashed and I ended up just kind of staying in my lane and doing what I always did. And um, so now I feel like I'm ready to kind of, you know, change things up a little bit, have some challenges while I still have my foundational business and that's still going and I'm still doing that work. Um, I can kind of be building this sort of on the side as I kind of bring it into more of a forefront. And then maybe in a couple of years, I kind of let more of the live work go. But my worry was like, because it is so draining and intensive, the live work that um, I was a little worried about burnout. So I think this opportunity, something I'm really passionate about, something that I know I can be in for the long haul. And um, like I'm getting to like build relationships with people and be helping them learn this skill. And I love cheerleading people and helping people and teaching workshops and stuff like that. So I think it will be a nice blend kind of going into 2024 as I'm kind of building that and bringing that into the forefront of what I'm doing as well. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Do you see... um... I guess uh, with with uh, artificial intelligence, just um, I guess kind of launching. How do you how do you see that maybe enhancing the work that you're doing, if 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 at all, or changing it? Yeah, I yeah I think it it might change things a little bit in my industry, but the thing that I I I. I feel pretty passionate about. I might change my mind tomorrow, but as of right now. Um, we will never get away from the benefit and value around human connection. And I feel like that's kind of like what I do is I help people connect and I help bridge those relationships. Um, You know, there's a reason why, even though all the conferences went online, we started bringing them back into person because people need that human connection piece. So, um, and I feel like, potentially, I don't know, maybe this type of skill set is going to be even more desired or sought after because I'm like a bit of a conduit for people, right, to have that connection. So, you know, I think, on, you know, there's going to be lots of amazing things that AI will be able to do to like do some automation and do like all of these, maybe some things on the back end and like maybe help create new and interesting visual imagery and stuff like that. But even then, I think as of right now, my opinion is that human connection piece is going to be more important than ever before. So I'm not necessarily, um, I'm just sort of moving forward with that hypothesis in mind and we'll see what happens. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen the same thing. I mean, you know, when it's, um, you know, looking at, you know, any, any sort of content creation, I, you know, obviously there are a lot of people that are using, um, yeah, the, the the various technologies to to produce content, but yeah, you, know, you still have to 
I don't, I, I don't know. It seems like there's, there's, as you said, the, the creative side of things, the human connection side of things are, there are those little, um, things that we do as people that, you know, you're probably not going to pick up unless you're another person and, and can kind of relate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's like, there's, you know, there's spoken and then there's all the non-spoken. Yeah right? There's nonverbal, all the nonverbal stuff. I always pick up on all that stuff too, when I'm in a room, yeah. right? When people like are, you know, awing in agreement or nodding their heads or laughing, you know, all of those things I take into what it is that I'm doing as well. Amazing. 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 Have you seen, um, like the outcomes of your work? Like, uh, if you're doing like, uh, like facilitation of, you know, I don't know, a planning session or, or something like that. Have you seen where your work has been taken and then, um, you know, maybe a couple of years down the road or something like that, there's a significant change in, you know, the business that you were, you were working with? Um, yeah, well, I've been doing it long enough now and I've got like a lot of my repeat clients that kind of bring me in like ongoing. So I get to kind of hear a lot of that, those stories. And I think because the majority of my work, honestly, this year has been repeat clients. Um, to me, that's just a testament that obviously it's resonating with people, whether it's in a boardroom or at a conference or what have you, right? So, you know, it's, I think once people experience it and understand that value, it's like, they're like, oh, well, this is just as important as catering, right? And, you know, obviously that's good for yeah. me <laughs> that, that I can keep uh, well fed with, with awesome client work, which is great. But um, yeah, it, it's, it, it is really beautiful to see when I, now that I have these long-term relationships with some of these people to be able to see how they've embedded um, what it is that we did or talked about and how that helped their organization move forward in, in a different way. Um, so yeah, it, it's pretty cool to see that for sure. Knowing that even when you leave that the work is, is ongoing and continuing and you had a small part in that, it's pretty cool. Do you have to teach people how to how to use the work or how to how to really benefit from the work that you're doing, um, you know, after after doing a doing a program. Yeah, so that's something that I started incorporating maybe two or three years ago because I felt like people weren't using the visuals that were created in the moment, which also has its own benefit, but I felt like people weren't using them afterwards as much as they could have. So I do have a document that I kind of edit once or twice a year that just kind of showcases all the different ways people have told me how they use graphics oh, afterwards, cool. um, just to okay. kind of let them think about or incorporate a couple of those things. Um, cause it, it definitely doesn't always have to be kind of a one and done in the moment. Um, there's a lot of extra value that they can gain from using them after an event yeah, as well. I can imagine. I can imagine. I mean, it's just gotta, it's how, it's how you make it sticky, right? I mean, that's, that's the important thing. If yeah. it's not sticky, then it was definitely a waste. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Awesome. I want to thank you uh, so much, um, you know, for being on the show and for, for sharing. This is, um, really interesting, really, um, educational for me. Um, as I, as I mentioned, you know, when we first talked, you know, I'd never, I'd never heard of, you know, anything like that other than, you know, I, I told you about the one consultant that sat there and he drew his notes instead of writing them down and sitting yeah. here just like, wow, this is like the coolest thing ever, but I could never draw. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you told me I that I, I can learn to draw in 15 minutes. So. I can take a very short amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you and, and, you know, learn more about your work or hire you, what's the, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, if you want to check out my like graphic facilitation or live illustration work, that's mindseyecreative.ca. Um, I do, even though it's .ca, I'm in Canada, but I work all over the world. Majority of my clients are in the U.S. actually. Um, and if you think it's interesting and you would like to learn this for yourself, um, you can go to sketchnote.school. Sketchnoting is a very common term for personal visual note taking. So sketchnote.school is like, I have a book on there, I have a newsletter, I have a community, all of that good stuff on there that I'm uh, building. And it's a, it's a good time. So if you want to learn that for yourself, you can head over. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And, and what about like the snowshoes out into the middle of Canada, rural Canada somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, yeah, if you want to see all the ha the odd happenings in my life, you can uh, follow me on Instagram, that's for sure. Yeah, that's, that's thanks all for, my Thanks for watching um, another episode Canadian of the Relentless Pursuit of Wedding Pies. Awesome. awesome. My, my name is Ray, so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Really enjoy it. Next time. Take care. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.
Sounds great. This has been the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins, and I'm so grateful that you've been here. If you got value from the show, I would love it if you would share it with others. Have a fantastic day. Take care.